All right, guys, well, welcome back to the channel. Today is a very special video. We're gonna be talking about how to make a workout plan that is fit for you. So whether you are a powerlifter, bodybuilder, um, hybrid trainer or runner, whatever it is, this, what I'm about to talk about can be applied and practiced in any of those contexts. Because I know today, um, especially like if you're a bodybuilder right now, there's a lot of people that are becoming hybrid um, fitness people, right? Who are doing bodybuilding or powerlifting, weightlifting, and also running. And to begin with, our first point is on how to make your own workout plan is to analyze your fitness goals. Meaning, like we talked about in the beginning, I'm gonna use me for an example. If I'm a bodybuilder, then my fitness goals might be, and again, I wanna maybe set very specific and not too general of goals. Goals, meaning I don't just wanna say, oh, I wanna be like Chris Hemsworth, or I wanna be like um, just super ripped and jacked. I probably wanna set goals, so for example, for me, a goal that I could set is as a bodybuilder, maybe I want to weigh 190 at 15% body fat, or I want to be able to bench 315 right, as a weightlifter or powerlifter, or if you're a runner, maybe you want to say, I want to run a half marathon in six months, or if you're a hybrid trainer, I want to be able to bench 315 and run a half marathon in a year, right, so I want you to take some time first, maybe pause the video, and analyze your fitness goals, analyze why you really want to get healthy, and the drive behind it, right, figure out why you want to do what it is you want to do, but then figure out what it is you want to do. So after you've done that and you've analyzed your goals, I want you to do the second thing now, or this is also what I've learned has helped. Um, when I determine my workout frequency, meaning when I determine how often I'm going to be working out, I've seen that it correlates with also my mission of the goal. So for example, if I am a bodybuilder, because I'm a bodybuilder, I like weightlifting. Right now, I aim to work out five, uh, five to six times a week. No more and no, and no less. I used to really work out pretty much six to seven times a week. But now that I've got just more responsibilities, I got more into content, I don't have as much time. Um, so I've just found ways to increase the intensity in my workouts and not work out as frequently. And now just work out five to six times a week instead of six to seven times a week. Right. So I usually take two rest days per week. But what this does whenever you analyze your workout frequency is that it also allows you to build a sense of commitment. So if you're someone new who's barely about to start working out and you don't really have a workout frequency because you didn't work out previous to this, I want you to take time to see and base it off of your schedule because you don't want to also neglect your responsibilities because that's how we put food on the table and that's how we nurture relationships. But I want you to make a workout schedule of maybe at least the minimum, I would say, is three days per week to see really optimal growth and steady growth and consistent growth. So anywhere from three to six days a week, because you always want to leave a day for rest, um, would be optimal, I would say. So after you have analyzed your fitness goals and after you have determined your workout frequency, now you're going to analyze how much time you have in that specific workout day. So for example, for me, I work out five times a week, right? So I usually tend to work out between one hour and 30 and two hours um, for every session, meaning that I take that long from beginning to end to finish my whole workout. And whatever my workout consists of, I know I'm going to finish it between that time frame because that's what my time and my busy schedule allows me to do. So if you're, if you're someone maybe who is maybe on the younger side and you just have a little bit more free time, um, I wouldn't limit yourself to just doing like a 30 minute workout when you know you could be getting at least an hour. Right. So I would say don't push yourself in the time, but don't limit yourself in the time either just because, you know, working out is hard. And, it can, you know, um, sometimes, yeah, we can just I, I feel lazy sometimes to go work out and maybe I want to cut my workout short sometimes, but I know what I can really be getting out of it. So don't limit yourself. Don't cheat yourself. So I want you to analyze again how often you want to work out. And for example, if you choose to work out Monday, Wednesday and Friday, now I want you to on whatever you're writing on or in your mental notes. I want you to analyze realistically based off of your schedule how much time you have to work out in each of those sessions anywhere from 30 minutes to maybe two hours maybe longer maybe shorter whatever your time allows you to do right because we want to work around your already busy schedule we don't really want to change things um, but sometimes it is needed right because sometimes um, priorities are important and health is a big priority so if you're someone who's new to working out, I would say try to implement this as a main priority. But again, don't take away from anything that um, you know you have to be doing, right? So after we've done this, guys, um, and again, this concept applies to anywhere if you're a runner or a weightlifter, right? And CrossFit, Olympic lifting, it all fills in there as well. So next, what we're going to do is you're going to choose your split. 
So split, Josue, what does that mean? Man, I'm glad you asked. So split basically means um, the combination of body parts that you're going to be hitting per exercise. So if you're a, if you're a bodybuilder, you probably know this split of push pull legs. So push pull legs means I'm going to do push on one day. So maybe I'll do push on Monday and push is anything that requires a pushing movement. So either in front, on top, whatever it is. Um, so if it's a push day, I'm going to be doing chest exercises because I'm pushing shoulder exercises because I'm pushing. And I can also include tricep exercises because I am actually pushing as well whenever I do my tricep, um, which a lot of people think like it's pulling, but it's actually pushing. So that's why you include triceps on a push day. Now, if you're going to do, um, so that's Monday. So let's say on Tuesday, I decide to do a pull day because the split, the combination of exercises in the workout is push, pull, leg. So push, we already specified it as chest, shoulders, and triceps. Pull is going to be anything that's a pulling movement, meaning back, because I usually tend to pull the bar or the rope to work out my back. Um, and then I can also include biceps because whenever you curl, you are literally bicep curling. You're pulling the weight from down gravity and you're defying gravity with it or you're fighting gravity with it. And I like to also include some abs just because abs is kind of, um, it's kind of like that weird guy that no one really talks about. Um, but I like abs kind of. Not really, but I try to include it in my pull days just because pull days really only consist of back and biceps. So it's missing kind of that third element like push has. So I like to put my abs also with um, my pull days. And then lastly, legs is pretty much just... And, and the reason that people add legs as their own or in this split specifically, legs is its own is because legs just have so many components to it. Like you have the calf muscle, you have the quad, you have the hamstring, you have the glutes, Right. And you have even more specific, you have like the abductors, adductors, um, you have the, just, just so many different stuff you can do. Um, so legs really gets its own day. And so the split again is push, pull, legs, legs having its own day. You can split it up between doing hamstrings, quads, calves, glutes, whatever it is, right? Um, you can find your own mixture in there. So that is what I mean by split. I know that was kind of a long version, but there are so many splits that you can do. Before I used to do just like a back by um, chest, try legs, shoulders. So there's splits that you can maybe Google research or whatever you like to do. You can even do like, if you work out only maybe two to three times a week, I would even suggest going like a full body workout for maybe two or one of those workouts. Um, people do that as well, just because they know their frequency is frequency in the gym is not going to be as long or as much as they would like compared to five days or six days in the gym. Um, so yeah, so you can implement this not only for weightlifting, but also for running. Um, right, so I'm going to implement or I'm going to explain to you all some different training styles that you can do um, for different types of workouts. So I already listed the bodybuilding, the push pull legs or the back by chest tri leg shoulders. Um, but if you're a power lifter who is training for strength and not really aesthetics, just wants to be like crazy strong. Um, here's a split that you can do. So you can do obviously you can follow the compound movements, which are squats, bench press and deadlift. You can space those out and then at the end of every workout. Or, uh, yeah, you probably want to do this at the end, not really in the beginning because you're going to fatigue yourself. Um, you can add accessory lifts that complement the compound lift for that day. So, for example, because I've done my fair share of powerlifting and I still kind of implement, um, I do what's called power building, which is strength and hypertrophy. So, this is kind of embedding into that. Um, but I've also just done strict powerlifting as well. So, for example, if I'm a powerlifter, I'm going to do a bench press session, maybe a three set of three at 90% of my one rep max, but then followed by that, I'm going to do maybe two to three accessory lifts of maybe some dumbbell chest press, maybe some seated chest flies, and then maybe some seated lateral flies for my shoulders, right? But the key with that, if you're a power lifter, you really don't want to max out your ability to be fatigued at the end of the workout. Because the biggest thing with power lifters is your ability to recover for the next big lift coming that later that week or tomorrow or in two days, right? Because you're constantly training with a lot of intensity. Your reps and sets, whenever you're a power lifter, look very low. They look like three by threes, one by twos, five by fives. They're not like four sets of 20, like bodybuilders train, like I train, right? So that's a common split you can do for power lifting. You can follow um, bench, squat, deadlift, kind of in that order because deadlift is the most taxing. So you want to give it at least two days to recover or you want to put it at the end. So, um, so that the other two before it aren't as taxing and you're, you're recovering effectively and efficiently for when it is time to do deadlifts because deadlifts in my opinion are the hardest um and then after you do them you know you have two days to recover so 
what I would recommend is doing that split of those three compound lifts, but then follow it by maybe no more than three or four, if you really want to push it, accessory lifts. Maybe no more than three, really, because you don't want to fatigue yourself. The point is, you're not really trying to grow aesthetically and be and be huge, right? You want to get stronger. And like, we've all seen those people who literally weigh like a loaf of bread and can push like a semi truck, right? Because they train to be powerful. They, they train for strength, right? They don't really train for aesthetics. So that's for powerlifting. Um, another split that you can do if you're a runner or a repetition basis that you can follow is you can go short, medium, and long, meaning I can some days choose to run short distances. So maybe a little bit more intensity, uh, maybe a little bit more of that sprint trying to finish on time the fastest that you can. Or you can also do a medium run, meaning, okay, this one's a little bit more endurance, but I also maybe don't want to slack off as much. And then we have long runs, which is, okay, I have maybe 10 miles to run today, 8, 15 miles to run today. So I'm going to pace myself, but also go the fastest pace that I can. Or you can mix it up in all of those days and choose between high intensity, low intensity, short, medium, and long runs. And you can also train with um, different areas like uh, hills, mountains, plateaus, whatever it is, valleys. So you can test your body. The point is you want to be testing your body and change your body over time. You don't want it to grow stagnant. So that's a split you can do if you're a runner. And then lastly, if you're a hybrid trainer, meaning you run and you also weight lift, which is the new thing, that's what the kids are saying, is you can combine elements of strength, but also cardio. So your split could include like strength day, meaning I'm going to focus on maybe a full body strength day of a bench press session with back and biceps and a little bit of triceps maybe. And then the next day, it's like a full on cardio day, meaning I'm going to go outside, I'm going to go to the hills and run maybe five miles, depending how hard or difficult or easy that is for you, right? But what you want to do whenever you do hybrid training, this is the tricky part. And that's why it's it's barely becoming as popular because there was a lot of controversy, or not controversy, maybe in my own head, but there was a lot of confusion behind it, right? People thought that running burns muscle, like if I run a lot, I'm not going to be as strong. And although that's not entirely true, what is true to that is that the time you spend running obviously takes away from time you could spend building up your upper body and gaining more muscle mass and gaining strength on the bench press or deadlift or squat, whatever it is, right? So by becoming a hybrid athlete, you are by default going to sacrifice a little bit of that upper body and some lower body strength as well, but there are huge benefits to it. So when it comes back to the hybrid training split, if you can find an efficient split that still lets you get a adequate, again, adequate amount of weight training, strength training, but also cardio and endurance and running training, then I think that's when you really become lethal as a hybrid athlete. So guys, next we have, or the next part of this is implementing what's called progressive overload. So we talked about sli uh, splits already, meaning like what you want to do and what they look like. But now we're going to really dive into the specifics of what it means to progress in these lifts. So all progressive overload is, if you haven't heard about it, it's pretty much forcing your body out of a stasis or out of a stagnant area. Meaning, if I'm always going to the gym and doing and getting on the bench and bench pressing 45s on each side for 12 reps, and then I'm leaving, 12 reps the next day, and then I leave, 12 reps the next day, and then I leave with the same weight, same reps, it's just different days, I will literally never grow. I'll maybe put like a pound of muscle on in a year, right? And the point with that is that I'm not forcing my body to experience any change over time. I'm not putting my body under the needed amount of stress for a literal um, physiological change in my body. So that's all progressive overload is. So what that means is that in each of these um, different ways to exercise and complete your fitness, there are different ways you can implement progressive overload. So we're going to quickly dive into what some of these look like. My mouth is dry. First one, guys, bodybuilding progression. So we're going to start with bodybuilding and going kind of in that same order we just followed for the split as well. So bodybuilding. Um, ways you can progressively overload and in weightlifting includes increasing weight. So if I'm always doing 30s, maybe I'll grab the 32.5s or the 37s if your gym has those, or maybe the 40s every now and then, right? Just to shock my body sh and, and show it like, hey, I'll swim in. You're being a weenie. Time to level up, right? So increase weights. You can also add more sets or reps. So what that means is if I'm always just doing four sets, no, that's actually a lot of sets. Not a lot of sets. Let me rephrase that. I just went back in time. If I'm always doing two sets, maybe here and there, I want to start implementing another set and add three in total or another set. And then I have four in total, right? So I want to be growing. I want to be adding more sets. Another way I can implement progressive overload in bodybuilding 
is to reduce the rest times between sets. So this is actually a coincidence because recently, so when I first started my fitness journey about four years ago, I used to really time my rest. Meaning like if I had just done a big set, I would rest for about three minutes. If it was kind of like a smaller set, like maybe not as many reps or not as fatigue, fatiguing, I don't know if that's a word for my muscles, um, then it would be around a minute, a minute 30 of rest time. So this is something that I took a break from for about three years really. And I'm implementing it now again, just because I don't have as much time now in the gym. So I really want to be efficient with every minute possible that I can in the gym. So I'm literally timing the second I put down the weight to the second I can pick up the weight again. So I, I just have like the alarm um, or the clock app on my phone and I just put the timer or I just set the thing to start counting. So this is another way. So if you reduce rest time between sets, again, this isn't true in every context, but generally if you hold that rule of reducing rest times between sets, that is also a way you can progress. Meaning instead of waiting 10 minutes because you went to go talk to your buddy and drink water and take a sip of your Gatorade before the next set, Maybe instead you just rest for a minute 30 and you're going to feel this. You're going to see the difference, but also feel the change in your muscles because you're going to be like, wow, this next set is not as easy as the first one because my rest time wasn't as much, obviously. So that's another way you can progressively overload. So next, if you're a runner, so I kind of combine the running and the hybrid training. So if you're a runner by yourself, but if you're also a hybrid trainer, meaning a hybrid tr uh, athlete, meaning you run and work out, this, uh, this next part applies to you. So for running or for hybrid training, Progression could involve increasing distance like we talked about in the split. So you can do like short or intervals or medium or long or like extra long. Um, you can also change up the speed, meaning just because it's a long day doesn't mean I'm going to take forever. I'm going to maybe try to sprint this whole thing. Or just because it's a short day doesn't mean I'm going to go slow. I'm going to try to sprint this whole thing. Or if it's a medium day, you can try to go slow instead of fast, right? So it's mixing up that speed, causing your body to change. Not always doing the same thing is the key, is the idea we want to keep with this, right? And another way you can do is implement interval training, meaning I'm going to go fast for this amount of time and then slow it down. Or I'm going to go up this hill sprinting, but then down I'm going to decelerate and just take, and just take a breather, right? Um, so it's just trying different um, ways to really implement this. And the last way for hybrid and running is um, terrain, meaning I want to climb Mount Everest, uh, run up Mount Everest, and then walk the plains the next day. Or go down the Mariana Trench, don't do that, but run down the Mariana Trench and then just run with butterflies the next day, right? So it's 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 causing not only a physical change, but like a, psycholo a psychological change. Because I was talking to my sister, actually, who just ran a half marathon. Um, 13.5 miles or seven miles, I believe, or two, 13.2. Um, and she was saying that because she had trained for hills, she was training hills because part of the race had hills in it because she already had trained with hills. The flat just seemed a lot easier and the hills weren't as difficult as if she hadn't trained for them. But even the flat parts became easier because she already experienced a harder terrain than just flat ground. So it's really cool when you implement this uh, essence of progressive overload and causing and forcing your body to change. So last but not least, guys, we have point number seven. I don't know if I've been keeping the points up here, but this is point number seven. Reverse engineer your goals. So by raise of hands, how many engineers do we have in this um, video? Apparently none because I didn't see any hands raised. But maybe you're an engineer watching this video. I don't really know anything about engineering, but I do know what a really but I do know what reverse engineering means. And so what I mean by reverse engineering your goals, that means that, well, I'm just, I'm just gonna plainly use myself in, as an example. So let's say right now it is April. By next April, I say, Josue, it is time to challenge yourself, man. It's time to also become a hybrid athlete. By next April, I want you to bench 405, but also be ready to run a marathon. Like you're gonna do one and then the other, basically. So what would I do in order to prepare myself to get there? I would work from the end in mind. I would work from the end goal to the start, meaning I would reverse engineer my goals. So what this can look like is I literally need to ask myself, what do I need to be benching? What do I need to be running? Like what needs to be my time? What needs to be my strength sessions in order to get there, right? And in order to do this, an example of this would be um, if I'm working from backwards, if I'm working from the end goal to the start, then I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to focus on strength first. I'm going to go, okay, so if I need to be benching three, uh, 405 by April, or I don't know if I said 315 or 405, let's say 405. That's a lot. Um, let's say I need to be benching 405 by next April. Then I'm going to make sure two months before, which is March, no, February, I need to make sure by February 
I am benching at about 95% or maybe even 97% of my one rep max, which is potentially 405, meaning I am already close to that strength level and I only have two more months to close that 3% or 5% gap that is needed to get to 405. And then I can do the same even two months before that in whatever's two months. My, my mind is too much, is, think, is thinking too much right now. Whatever's two months, two months, so four months before the last goal, I need to be benching maybe 90% of my one rep max and to fill in that 10% gap by the time I get to 405, right? And so I'm working backwards. And so same thing for a marathon. I believe a marathon, correct me in the comments if I'm wrong, is about 26, 27 miles around there. Um, so what I would need to be doing is I need to be saying the two months before my marathon, which is February, because my marathon's in April, same time I'm going to bench 405. I need to be sure that I'm running, let's say, um, if, if, if a full marathon is 26 miles, I need to be running 24 miles every other day or twice a week or three times a week. And then I progress even lower from there, meaning two months before that, I need to make sure that I'm running at least 21 to 20 miles every other day or every three days, right? So you're working with the end in mind and you're building backwards to make sure that you know and you're setting these milestones of where you need to be. And if you reach those milestones, you know, you basically know you're on a good progression and on a good rate to reach your goals, which for me would have been bench 405 and run a, and run a marathon the next day, right? So that's kind of how you would um, reverse engineer, starting with the end in mind and then going to the beginning. So last guys, before we end this video, I just want to encourage you after everything I just said, um, this is not, this is about 70% of getting to your goal. The other 30% is just you. It's just you waking up every day, committing to whatever it is you plan to do from this video. After we listed our frequency, um, what your goals are, progressive overload, your split, whatever it is, all those things are important. And that's about 70% of get, of accomplishing your goals. But the other 30% and maybe even more, honestly, is how much you're willing to commit to this. Meaning, yes, relationships are fun and they're okay. And hanging out with friends are fine. And I love hanging out with friends, right? But sometimes, guys, those things can either benefit you or hurt you. And usually when they're hurting you, it's time when you need to re re really re- um, analyze everything in your life. Like this isn't just about fitness. This isn't just a fitness video, but it's also a life video, right? You want to make sure that the people in your circle, the people around you are complimenting your goals, not hurting your goals and are supportive of your goals, not just, um, non-believers of what you say you're going to achieve. And again, if you say you're going to achieve something, you need to make sure you do it. So I encourage you guys, if you're going to go down this path and you're going to set goals, which I highly encourage you to, because goals give purpose and purpose gives life and God honors purpose and God honors life. If you're going to go down this path, guys, commit 100%, be the best that you can be, and go hard in life, man. Guys, with that, I encourage y'all to live faithfully, fearlessly, and joyfully, guys, and we'll catch y'all next week.